And last time, um, if I remember correctly, we went through these um, these diagrams and looked at how you know environments kind of work as maps that take you to the part of a record that you want to do. And so I thought today I would like maybe go through and at least um, start to edit a file here. Now let me let me save it as like um, something else. Um, what's going on over here? Let me bump um, with the records. .hs. So I thought what we would do is start, you know, I'll show you how to go through this and kind of, you know, I've been giving you a lot of code, but we haven't like maybe started from the beginning. We probably have sometimes, but not, not enough. And so I want to like take this and figure out, first of all, how to implement this syntax. And then um, we'll move on to the other, there were other, uh, this is just one image of the syntax from the book on page, if you have the book on page 136 is where we're working. So this thing is entirely new, this act. Well, maybe not. It, it's, uh, here it is. Okay, var names. So I'm going to now, you know, I'm trying to work in a file that I already have. So I'm going to change this type to X so that it matches that. And I'm going to say it's either a string. And I am going to have to make this a data type now. Or it is a, now this is, um, I don't know, I've been looking at some Haskell code and people can use like um, infix operators seemingly, you know, seamlessly, they just use them. But I mean, I can't really, so I mean, I could call this um, whatever, the X dot constructor. And so now what is R? Well, R is a string. So like, you know, if we have, um, well, maybe I even, well, if we have something like R1 dot R2 dot Q, the R's are identifiers. And then you've got, you know, this would be R1, this one here would be R1, and then the R2 dot Q would be, another X. So we, we, you're sort of um, eating up strings from the left going into the dot notation. And, you know, I think in, um, I might have done it backwards in my, in, uh, from that in my implementation that I had for Schmidt's book. But this is what that would look like. Right? So the R is just a R, I wrote down here, R, X, and P are just strings or identifiers and has, I mean, you know, we could make another thing up here. We could say um, type identifier, oops, it helps to spell it, is just a string. And then down here, I could use identifier. And that would be sort of looking forward to the day when it's not good enough to just have a string because we don't want strings like, you know, um, space, tab, tab, space as an identifier. Okay, 
But now what? I have to go everywhere and change wherever there was a var name to an X. Except there, I think I'm well, well, we'll get to the environments. And, you know, we're not going to really, um, I think I'm just going to forget about this. Um, well, all right. The, the call by name is a pain because it's got all this extra, all this code at the bottom here, if you've looked at this, is all for substituting into the different syntactic classes that we have. And, you know, I just don't care about it that much. So, you know, we could just get rid of um, this. And we could get rid of call by name implementation here. And I could just comment it. it. I mean, I don't really want to get sidetracked with um, trying to figure out how to do substitutions into these hierarchical names. I mean, it's probably not hard, but it's not really part of what I want to want to do today. I want to get to implementing records, not worry about about that. Okay, so we've got our X now. I have, I do have here somewhere, where's proc name defined? There's proc name. And so that just is going to become almost identical definition. And it's just gonna be P. Oh, I meant it, I'm gonna make it a data type so that I can have the different constructors. Oh, and I forgot the instructor up here is, you know, I don't know. You know, I the thing I've used before, I think I say, okay, this is a simple identifier, simple X identifier. And then maybe this one's like a complex or, yeah, I, I could use uh, the X dot here, that's okay. And so then down here, I can say, oh, this is a simple X identifier. Ah. Ah, the two banes of my existence, insert mode and caps lock. All right. Oh, and I better add a um, deriving clause on here or else we won't be able to see them. At least do show, and I'm gonna wanna know probably whether they're equal and that can easily be derived. Now, I guess I ought to look, well, we, we don't need the P's except down here, but we might as well do them since we just did this one. So P is either a simple P which of a identifier, or it's a p dot constructor with an identifier and a p. Okay. If at any time you have any question whatsoever, I mean, the whole point of me being here instead of a robot is I can answer your question. If you go like, oh, well, I don't get it. Why are you doing that? I mean, maybe so far so good, right? I implemented this piece of syntax here as a data type. I implemented this piece of syntax here. And now I'm gonna look at the A expressions. And so we said vars are now x's and i think i fixed that when i replaced oh i better not forget though i need to replace proc name 
with P. And I'm not sure I'm going to want those P's there, but okay. So the A expressions are already done because now I do have an X. You know, in the, in the Haskell data type here, I need to give a constructor name to these. Okay, and he has nums first. So if it helps, I can do um, Oh, let's see. And this one is VX. So I can do them in exactly the same order. He has a num, and we have the NUM constructor, and then he has an X, and then he has addition, and then he has, uh oh, um, yep, multiplication, then minus, and then the parentheses which we don't really need, um, although maybe the parser needs them. So, I mean, this is, see, this is the other thing. He's kind of like building syn as something that happens in, in the syntactic analysis into his abstract syntax tree, which is not really necessary. So anyway. So now let's look at B expressions. Okay, they don't change at all. So these stay exactly the same. And I have equals greater than not and. Oh, except I have the, I have, like he doesn't, why does he not have a B paren? That's weird. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now we've got our P's and we have a proc name so that we can do the call P. So let's go look at statements. So anyone have a question? Don't be shy. I mean, if you're like, oh, I don't, why did you do that? Please ask me. That's why I'm here. Um, okay. So statements are assign X gets the value of A. Skip, okay. Sequencing, if then else, while, begin, and now he forces this and I'm going to say just we're going to add it to our declarations. We're going to add a new um, DR. We're going to have records to our declarations. So this should be okay. We have begin declarations and we'll update to add the DR part to the decal thing. And then we have call P and, you know, we've got an argument still in this bit of code because I took the one with the arguments. Okay, now, what is uh, his DV is here, var D spring string A expression. And then he has, you know, or epsilon, and I've actually got this explicit semicolon operator, which gives meaning, you know, it will give a semantics to the semicolons that he has in here which he's using as a cons, and I'm gonna compose together them, the, the thing. So we've got the var D constructor takes, now we don't want it to take a string, we want it to take an X. Oh, that's interesting. We do want it to take a string. We want it to be a simple, this is a subtle point, right? This is not a capital X. This is a string or an identifier. So I can make it an identifier. And then it takes an A expression. And then the rest of this, we're gonna handle with this D semi operator. So a procedure also, it doesn't take a P, it takes an identifier. And then, you know, for our, uh, implementation we had that it takes a call type and where did that go here it is up here oh 
I think it, um, oh God. makes more sense to put this down here, closer to where it's first used. Okay. So there's the call type, and then the formal parameter is just a string, and then we give it a statement, which is the body. And now we need to add record, and we need an identifier, and then we need some decals, or decal, which is a complex declaration. Okay, so did you see that? This We made a constructor called record, and the first argument, R, is something that's an identifier. So we put in an identifier, and then we can handle these multiple kinds of things in any order with this declaration if we, you know, um, just have this type decal which we are going to actually implement, you know, how do you glue together multiple things? I don't know. That could lead to trouble, but we'll leave it for now. So we implemented the syntax. Any questions, comments? Would you like to see it a different, done a different way? Why is the identifier in both simple P and in the P dot? And in the uh, X, you mean, or? Uh, in the data type P. P up here? Yeah, like. Because oh. this lowercase P is an identifier. So like you have to be able to kind of like get to the end. Like what's, you know, so. The key in this one, it would go, you know, you'd say, okay, let me see. How do I write this down? Um, I think maybe I could make the font bigger and then I could actually type it in here. Let me just make it even bigger, 18. So if I type, um, if I want to get this one here, it would be, it's horrible. This is why you need parsers. Right, so we would say it's a P dot of R1 followed by a P dot of R2 of a simple, uh, simple P of Q. So that's what this notation does. It's like you're building the thing. This is, and, and this matches the way that you want to look things up, right? When you want to look things up, you want to look up the map for R1 first and so strip that off. So we're going to navigate through the environment in this way, we'll do R1 first, then we'll do R1, two, and when we get down to simple, we know because this is a simple P, we know we're looking, we need to look in the um, procedure part of the environment. Does that make sense or no? Yeah, it makes more sense now. It's a pain in the neck. And, and this is where having a parser so that you can try things out makes things so much easier. Like trying to type in these, you know, I don't know. It, it actually, it kind of like, it hurts my brain to think of these, <laughs> to, to do these. But it's a P dot takes an identifier. So there's R1 as an identifier. And then it takes a P. And so then this is a P because it's got a P dot 
and the name, whoops, I need a closing quote there for R2. And then it needs another P. And now I'm at the end. So I do a simple P just on the name Q. So, you know, I'm looking at, at this name just right up above here. Okay. I mean, well, we'll we'll actually <laughs> we're gonna see how we <laughs> how we do this um, in a little bit because we're gonna start ripping these things apart to navigate through the records. So, you know, I have like this huge amount of faith here because I haven't really looked this over <laughs> before class today and i'm just hoping okay yeah we should we should be able to just type this in pretty easy so um here is something that we haven't all right so it looks like stores are we're not going to stores are not going to change and, you know, in this version of the code, I have this kind of cleaned up thing where location, next loc is a kind of loc and max store size is a kind of loc. Or you use the constructor loc and apply it to an int. So then a store is a map from locations, these things to ints. And the empty store, so from list, is a thing that will build a map if you have a list of pairs of the right type. So from list is going to look at this and it's going to go, oh, the first thing is um, a location and the second thing is an int. So this is going to be a map from loc to int. And in fact, I declared it to be just above. I said S0 is a store, so it knows from list, this better be a loc, and this better be a loc, and the two following things better be an int. And the way you initialize an empty store is you set it so the next available location is location zero, and we haven't seen the maximum size of the store so far was zero. So then we use um, a lookup store and we just define that to take a look in a store and you just do STO bang look. Now that's the unsafe version of map lookup, but I don't know. I mean, in the, some of the code you've had, it's been even worse really. So this is just um, an overloaded thing that will say, okay, so I've overloaded bang here to be a little bit better than just crashing. It still crashes if you try to look up something that's not there, but it also gives you a, um, it gives you the key that you were trying to look at. And when you try to show them M, it shows it as a list, as a from list with all this whole, the whole map gets shown to you in this error message. So I don't know. I find that that's useful when you make some little subtle bug and you can't, but it, you know, it, it, it works. Um, this works for all kinds of maps, right? This is for arbitrary maps and you have to be able to show a, and you have to be able to show K and K has to be ordered so that it can serve as a key for a map. So these parts, um, you know, what I do to get this right is I comment this thing out and load my code and ask Haskell, what's the type of that? And it tells me, oh, it's a show A, show K, or K, arrow, map. Then here's the real thing. It takes a map, which is the first argument, and it takes a key, which is the second argument, and then this is what it does. Questions about that? Okay. So what is this saying? 
Um, now we need, we have, um, I, I, you know, I think really this is still just an identifier. I, I knew that these don't want to become these complex things. Those are the maps that we're going to use to navigate down into an environment. And then we have to add an ENVR thing here. Oh, so I need a comma after that. And an ENVR, he's telling us, is a map from an identifier, which is the name of the record, into, well, and this is, this is actually in the book on the page. It's a, um, it's basically, it's just an environment because we have all of our environment parts together and that's what ENVR is. So this for us is an environment because it's in this record, ENV. It's all packaged together. Okay, so now we have these update functions, so we might as well write an update. Um, record ENV. And that's going to take a record and um, an E which is an environment and we're going to be working with an environment. And what we want to do is take the environment and set the ENV record part to be equal to the insert of R and E into the record part of this environment. Okay, so this is basically saying, okay, yeah, take this environment and update it so that the record field has this value instead. And how do I get the record field? You know, I get it by applying the, there is, I don't know how to do it yet. There is dot notation that's being supported now. Uh, in which case I would, I'm not, you maybe have to include some new language feature or something. So, but, you know, I could say dot um, ENVR if I had that feature, but I don't think I do. So I'm going to, I'm not going to try it. That's too many things at once. So what happens now? Well, I, I mean, I could do my lookup. Um, record. So I say, look up the ver the location stored in the variable, and this is the proc definition. And so, what are we looking up when we look up in the record? It's kind of the um, it's a, we're looking up an env an environment because that's what we're storing away. So I can call it lookup record ENV. And um, then I give it a record name and then I give it an environment. And I say, okay, apply ENV sub R to that environment. That gives me the record, uh, the the, this record, field, which is this map, and now I apply that, I look up R in there, in that unsafe way. Okay, and so up, I'm gonna need to update this. And so I'm gonna, you know, we never used, the, I never used this idea that I might use multiple operations to, different operations depending on which environment I'm updating. 
So I can say here, uh, ENVR gets the value of ENVR of ENV2 and then apply the operation to So what is this doing? This is how I'm going to glue together two records because union is an operator on maps. And we want this second one. I, you know, I don't know. Maybe this is dumb. Maybe I should, um, maybe I should do it on ENV1 first and ENV2 second. And then I just have to flip all my code where I union things because what happens with union is, in fact, I think I am gonna do that. I'm just gonna change all these to ones and change all these to twos. And then I'm gonna say, this is app ENV of union. And so, this thing will take two environments, union ENV. So now I need to go down and look. The thing is, is what happens in union when you map, when you union two maps together, the first, the one, the left argument takes precedent. So like if you had an entry in the map, the variable map over here for X, and you had an entry in this field, in this map for X, this one would be the one you keep with the union operator. Does that make sense? Uh, is ENVR supposed to combine with ENVP at the bottom there? Ah, thank you. Good eye. Yeah, that would, well, you know, that would be a type error and it would save me. But now I better. I better go look for um, union ENV because it does matter. Where do I use it? So here, what I need to do is I need to swap the arguments. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I guess I want to do union ENV2 and then union ENV1 and then ENV. All right, I feel like, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm playing with fire because I kind of have gone for a long time without trying to check and see if I broke things. Um, so I'm gonna, now where am I here? Bump with records, I think that's right. So, um, Okay, 204. That's weird. Why would that one be broken? Ah, because I'm doing that B parent thing that I deleted.
And I don't know, that's probably going to cause all kinds of mess problems. Boy, I got a lot of errors now. Let's see. Good thing I did this. Let's go to, um, uh, what is it? One, 181. Did I forget a comma? Okay. Okay, we maybe need to fix our environments. We haven't really looked at what, let's see. So why is this complaining about saying couldn't match type bloke with statement, call type, formal parameter, ENV. It look, feels like it thinks um, doing something with the store. Ah, maybe this one doesn't have a field. That's one thing. Let's see what, if that changes anything. Didn't change that, still. complaining about this. Nobody sees it? Come on. I got a lot of eyes on this piece of code. Let's extra points for anyone that finds it. I wonder if that's a problem. No. I mean, all right, so what is this saying? Ah. Couldn't match type loc. With this. Expected type map. Actual type map loc. So maybe I need to say Oh. Hmm. What is the type of this thing? What is op? What is the type of union? Oh, oh God, what do I have to do? Okay. So if I want to write down the type of this thing, it's a little bit complicated, right? It's
this is kind of interesting. I think we're running into a complex type problem here. Yeah. See, this is, yeah, I do, I guess that's, maybe that's why I had an op one, <laughs> op two and op three, because they have different types. Like union here, this union has a different type from this union, has a different type from this union. So that's kind of unfortunate. But it's union. <laughs> so this is a little complicated to try and explain. Um, I, what I was trying to do was I was trying to pass in one operation and the operation is this polymorphic operator union, which has um, well, we looked up the type just above here. It has, union has this type here. And so it comes down in here and it says, okay, I've got union and it says, what's the type of the map for variables? And it says, oh, that's a map from identifier to locations. And this one is also a map from identifier to locations. So now then that fixes the type of union to be a map, the K and the A got fixed. And when it goes to the next line, it doesn't know what to do. It can't type it. Now there is some kind of... Do we not have to change the type for a union environment? or add additional environments to that? No, it still works on two environments. And it's defined to be, do this and give it this union, 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 the same one. But the first one is gonna get typed for variable environments. The second one is gonna get typed for um, procedure environments. And the third union is gonna get typed for, um, record environments. And so these two remaining ar arguments here, this, you know, this is like the curried thing that you can do in Haskell. So union ENV is a function that's waiting for two environments. And so that means it's waiting for this environment, it's waiting for that environment, and it's gonna return an environment. Does that make sense? I mean, I could write in here, you know, like E1 and E2 and put them at the end. And that would be okay if that makes more sense to you because now I'm providing all the arguments to app ENV and union env is a function of two arguments but if you have the arguments at the end like there we can just get rid of them and up oh, i have another one e1 so i can get rid of that one but i do need to provide three copies of union let's see what happens you know i i think um all right now we got some different error but that's good so i can go there I think this is the problem. But if we used any different programming language, um, there would be some, you know, I don't know. So I wrote this code and it optimized a certain thing. If we did it his old way, it wouldn't make, it probably wouldn't be, we wouldn't have had that problem, right? So maybe I made a mistake there because it made the code a little bit more complicated 
And this is a little bit hard to understand. Like if you ran into this error and you don't really know Haskell, you're going to go like, what? Whenever you see the dreaded word rigid, you know you've done something like this. So there, there was the word rigid in the error message there. All right, so let's see what this one is. Um, oh, this I think, didn't I get a, rid of a parens also? I think, oh no. Oh, I shouldn't have an X in there. On one line 195. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have to we have to do better at lookup var look because now we have to look up that is like potentially a complex thing. So I gotta go back and I gotta fix up lookup var look. And I got to do it like this. I got to say, look, if it's a simple X, then you just do this. But if it's a record, a re what is it? What did I call it? Um, a dot. What did I call it? Uh, X. Don't I have an over on this page? No. Is it a dot X? I just don't understand why Emacs can't find it. I don't think that's right. X dot. Okay. So this is actually the thing that is this. This is the way we look up a name. And so it says, okay, look, if the name is complex, we got to do something. If the name is simple, you just look it up in the variable environment. So that was the first line that I had here. And now, What do I do? Well, I got to look up in the record part. And what did he call it? R and X. And so if it's like this, then I got to look up in the record part for R. And then I got to look up var look. I got to do this for that X. So this little bit of code here is pretty key. This is the one that lets you chase down one of these complex things through a record. If it's a complex one, the first name is the name of the record. And so what you do is you grab the record field of the current environment and you look up R and, oops, and then I got to say, look up var loc. Okay. And that's my new environment. And so what do I got to look up? I got to look up X in that environment because remember the record is going to give you back an environment named R, if it's there. And now I'm going to have to do the same thing here. Oh, God. All right. I mean, I'm going to have to do the same thing for every case. I'm going to have to say, OK, it's not just a P. It's something that looks like simple P.
x, in which case it is just look up x. And otherwise, it's ex almost exactly like this, right? Except that I got to look here in the P environment. No, in the, I still look in the record environment. And I look for X in the environment indexed by this R. Does that seem right? Uh, do we need a change lookup var loc? Ah, and right. This not... should be look good, 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 good. You're a good programmer. Good help, proc. Yeah, this has to recursively call itself. And so then down here again, we've got a, a simple. Oh, that's interesting. But now we don't have complex, we just have identifiers for records. And so that one is okay. I don't know. What does he do about complex identifiers for records? Because you could be looking up a record inside of something else. I think we need to make, um, it's interesting, why doesn't he need it? Uh, generalized variables. Well, maybe he does it elsewhere. Like maybe look up record environment is something that we, is a kind of a utility that we added. And he may have, yeah. Okay, has procedure, generalized procedure names. Why does he not have generalized record names? Well, okay, let's just comment it. Maybe there's no natural place that we need that utility function yet. So we do have our lookup var loc, which does this. And then there's another image that uh, is of the, um, I think the next one maybe is transition rules for generalized um, It's 9.1. Generalized variables. Oh, I have it twice. Okay, sorry. Um, 9.2. Okay, so now we got to look at the arithmetic expressions. But I, the only thing that gives that gets different here really is that first of all, we have to pass the record and the variable environments. And so, um, but we have them packaged together, so that's okay. And then, you know, when this thing here is possibly a complex name, this X in, in this first line of the big step thing here, that is possibly, um, a complex name, but 
our lookup loop will end up getting all the way down to the variable entry and then you look up in the variable entry and this thing will turn up turn out to be a location so let's try let's let's make sure now we can load this let me see um okay we're almost there 173 Uh, does the lookup for the proc have to be a uh, x dot? Yeah. What is? Oh, yes. Right. Where? Where is it turning? It's. It's. I maybe I didn't save it. Let's see. Ah. Page, not page line. One seventy six. Okay, there it is. So we're giving it P, or we're giving it X's when we need to give it P? Yeah, something like that. I don't understand it. Let's see. The expected type should be an X. So why? But we're looking in the proc environment. Um, let's go look at our declaration of, they all map identifiers. So Page line one seventy seven. It also get. Oh, is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Two forty eight. Yeah, so <laughs> um, this is in the call, and that makes sense, but um, what did we do in um, when we defined call? We made it a P, so it could be a complex thing here. So we probably need two cases or we need to resolve that name somehow. Well, I don't know. Look up proc definition I would think would do it. But maybe this why What did we do in the declaration? Oh, we haven't gotten to declarations yet for fixing them up. Have we? Yeah, we we don't have any problems here, I don't think. Oh, except that. Um 
what we're what we're, I think we're running into is like an issue with you know I think I want to put something like simple y around here and then it will work in the rest of the code so let's see what one is it 248 yeah simple x y Well, I didn't expect this to take this long. Sorry. This is not where I wanted to be doing, but okay. Line 250. Okay. Update proc env. And so this P here should be a simple that's the name of the procedure but we don't what do we do in update proc env Okay, it just updates the environment. But, so why can't P just be a string there? I don't think that simple thing is gonna work, actually. That should be okay. proc environment takes a identifier because the it's got to be an identifier and that one has to be an identifier I think Do you see a lookup proc anywhere? I don't know. Why, why is this line in error? Uh, I think it's looking for a simple P for that update. I think it is, but I don't. I guess I didn't see it when I looked at it. Um, why? Let's try it. See, I thought update proc environment, though, when you look at it, um, well, let's see what happens. I don't think I'm I'm not sure. I'm feeling like it's not right. I mean if if this if that's right, then probably down here we're gonna have some kind of similar thing. Maybe not. I mean call by value just um uses the A expression. So like update var environment should take a string X. Let's see. I don't, you know, I'm not confident about this, but let's try it. Yeah. Okay. It didn't like that on 150.
Now, look up var loop does want it. So, what, what happened when we did that? We saved that, we reloaded it. Expected type identifier, and it got a P. Okay, where is this? Line 250. So this is some kind of capital P. Oh, uh, yeah. Because when you call, you can call in, indexed into a record. But it feel, felt like this lookup proc definition. That's interesting. Maybe we need to modify lookup proc definition to return a pair, which is just the identifier together with the body as opposed to um, just the body. See, I could say like, okay, let's say, um, Oh, I better not change that if I use it below. So let's say P prime comma this. And now below, wherever I use P, I want to change it to P prime. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, what is that PDEF? Uh, no, I lost. Oh, yeah, PDEF. PDEF? Ah, okay. When you have a complex thing like this, like it's a four tuple, mm -hmm. you can, um, and I want to, I want to kind of get a, a handle. I want to give names to the parts. So I want to be able to refer to the body down here. I want to be able to refer to the call type and X and ENV prime. And so what do I do when I do that? Well, I just, but I also PDEF at sign means, oh, this whole thing also, you could have just called it PDEF, but then uh -huh. I don't get a handle on it. So it kind of says, this is a, a you know, a name for this whole thing. Oh, but you've also destructured it into the four parts and given them names. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. So, but where is, where is now, where is my P on line 150? That should be okay now, but I got to go look at, um, what was the one I want to look up proc def. It's funny that, you know, we need to return the thing we were looking at, but in the simple one, I'm just going to return X comma Let's see if that works. I don't know. Jeez. This is like what I would call a bad day. <laughs> Still having trouble on line 250. What? Ah, that's where I need the P prime. <laughs> Are there any other P's? Uh, yep. Okay, so do you see what I just did? The name that you call with, this is one of these P, uh, one of these complex names. But what I really need at the end is I need the final name. So like in that example we we're looking at before, r1.r2.q, 
I need Q to be able to look the thing up. And then I need to use Q, the name Q. So I'm hoping, let's, let's see, did that fix it? Let's see. And so what I decided to do was, oh, I'll just make that lookup procdef thing return two things. It will return the identifier that's bound and it will return, you know, the four tuple that is associated with it. Okay, so now I gotta go to um, 258, 267. Oh God, yeah, that's got to be a P prime too. That's just the error message. All right. Aha. Okay. Now we don't have enough time to do the declarations, but um, one thing we want to do is we want to add a big step decal for a record and it has a name which is an identifier and it has an env and then i'll call it um e and then we have the current environment that we're working on and the store. And so what are we going to do is we're going to return. So what we're going to do is go down here. I mean, we could do it just up above, but all the other lines have it like this, where env prime is equal to update. record env with r and e in env r oh we just give it env and so then this is env prime and declaring a record does that change the store It does. So this, let's see, where's his um, code for this? I'm, I guess we're done. I'll continue to do this and I'll, you know, share this code with you and you can take a look and see what happens. Um, variable procedures. Here's the declarations for structured records. Okay, here they are for record rules. And he's missing the store in there. as far as I can tell. I mean, at the time that I scribbled all over my book, I was absolutely convinced. And I think I've implemented this before actually, but I wanted to sort of do it with you. So, okay, I guess I'll say that's the end of class. Anyone who wants to help me figure it out or watch more is welcome to, but we're, we're out of time. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All right. See you. I actually have another kind of sort of coding question. Okay. Um, it was from quite a while back when we were doing the union stuff. Uh-huh. Well, if you could go back to the union part. Sure. Um, like we passed it three different unions. Right. But they're all the same. But so, I mean, it's, this is kind of cool. I think if you look at the type of union, it takes,
takes a map, and this K is the key type, and the A is the thing you store in the map. So it takes one, two maps, and returns a third map. Okay. But as soon as it evaluates this line, if you look, if we could look up here, let me see, I can make this one thing. Whoops, sorry. If I could see the environment above where, oh God, I went. Sorry, okay. So if we can scroll up just a little bit, here's the environments, the type, you know, the declaration for environments. As soon as it execute, evaluates this line, it says, oh, these are, in, Ian, these are maps from identifier to loc. And then it, when it comes down here and it tries to, so it, it, what it did was it took the type of union, which is this generalized, you know, map K A and it substituted for K identifier and it substituted for A loc. And it says, I know what union is now. And it went down in here and it said, okay, union is a function that maps, that takes a map like this and another map like this and returns a map like this. Okay. And then when it goes to the next line, it says, oh, wait a minute, you're trying to apply union, which has been specialized to this type but now you, you're using the wrong type. And the error message even sort of reads that way. It says, I was expecting loc, but I saw this. And that's because when it evaluated this, this line, it specialized it. The, the, so the type of union is a polymorphic type. In other words, you can substitute any K in there as long as it has, it's an element of the or type class. And you can sub substitute any type A you want in there. It doesn't have to be in the ORD type class. And identifiers are ordered, so we're okay. So, um, but I guess what once I'm they figured out the type for that, they when they try to apply it here, they go like, wait a minute, now you're trying to tell me it has a different type. I already figured out the type. It was identifier to loc. So I guess the part I'm a little bit more confused about is why we have to like declare a union uh, like variable inside the inside of AP E and V. So uh -huh. why do we have to, so like if you had like a, a plus for example, and you know you just add two numbers together, you just use the function. You don't have to declare the plus is going to be inside of this function that we're writing. So I'm just a little bit confused why we have to declare three different unions inside of AP, E, and V. Well, because the first one gets used here because I say use op one. And so the first one becomes a union that knows how to work with maps from, how to union together maps from identifiers to locations. And the second one, knows how to work with maps from identifiers to state, you know, four tuples like this. And the third instance knows how to work with union together maps that look like this. Yeah, I, I feel like you I'm know, not asking that question, right? <laughs> there is a, there is a, this is, this is weird, I think. I think I could, I could do this. And then I could say something like, I mean, I don't know if this is any cleaner or not, but let me just show you what I'm thinking. I can say, okay, you know, maybe a let statement is more, I can say let op one equals op, op2 equals op, and op3 
three equals up in this. So now I'm only passing union one time. Does that, does that feel better? But, you know, now actually, you know what? This could work. This is so weird that this could work. And I just call them all op one. Let's see. Let's see if this works. Two ninety three. Well, that's far away from here. Let's go see what's on two ninety three. Now, it's something very subtle, though, uh, of what just happened there. Oh, yeah, this is the code that we're writing that's not complete. So I'll just comment it. Save it. Go. Let's see if we can load it again. Um, no, it didn't work. It's complaining about it all over the place. I thought the let would work because inside of a let, you get a different kind of binding. I'm surprised that didn't work actually. Hmm. Oh, did I do something wrong down here? I want, no, no, that's good. What is it telling me? Yeah, it still has the same problem. I thought the let would fix it. So I could say let, and then I say, you know, op two equals op, and let's see if this one works. Op three equals op. And this, now I do, you know, one, two, three. So at least the user doesn't have to mess with multiple versions. Huh. I just got to give it that. I just got to give it three arguments, sorry. <laughs> and you know, there are some ways around this and they're involved like more sophisticated uses of the type system that I actually don't know. Okay. You know, I might be able to say something like, let's see if I can do it. App BNV has type and that's, you know, like map. So here's what I want to do is I want to say, um, I, you know, and I don't, uh, let's see, like, I think, I wonder if I can say ord <laughs> k in here. I have nowhere, uh, no idea where that would go. Let's see. Um, you can go if you, if you're, if you, you know, if you don't care about this, that's fine. Okay. Um, I think I understand better my, my question now, just after watching you manipulate the stuff around a little bit so I okay good i'm glad i'm i you know i worry that like i'm like oh i'm wasting everyone's time but i do feel like it's helpful to watch it some you know the programming um 
I'm just going to see, does this work? Definitely. Um, just as a, I, I at least, I prefer watching um, you actually program during these lectures. I think it, it really helps. Uh huh. Good. Oh. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go now, I think. So. Yep. That's fine. I appreciate it. See you later. See you later. Bye.